going to try and, and add just very little to this, uh, not because I, um, or I certainly not going to repeat anything, but not because I don't agree, but uh, actually because I do agree with everything that's been said. But I do want to talk about two things very, very briefly, um, just to, to, to summarize. And one is, is what I think are two things that we, that we kind of alluded to a little bit this morning, but haven't really um, maybe explicated quite, quite as much. And then I want to touch on a handful of what I think are maybe agenda items, interface type things that, that I think we should think about. Um, the, the, the three talks that we, that we kind of noticed already, we talked a little bit about awareness, about knowledge um, over time, across issues. We talked a little more about what's going on in our heads, um, or Dan rather did, uh, and how that interfa interfaces with, with the science. And, and now I'm moving it a little bit up to the, to the political level, to the social level, because as I said this morning, I do think that what we're dealing with is 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 not a, a, a dyadic relationship where there's scientists and there's the public and, and where we maybe engage, maybe it's, it's bi-directional, um, but we're just two dots in a network of a whole bunch of players um, and, and certainly not the loudest or most effective voices in most cases. Um, the first one, and this, by the way, on, on synthetic biology, and after J. Craig Venter announced that he would create life in the lab or had created life in the lab, aside from the scientific accuracy or, or the lack thereof of that statement, uh, this is the press coverage that it produced. Um, J. Craig Venter, or at least uh, I'm drawing of him with Frankenstein in a test tube. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, so you can kind of already get it at, at, uh, or see what I'm getting at, and that is that we're dealing with a, with with a science that modern science is uniquely different from what we've seen before. A, in terms of the weight with which it brings about changes in the scientific field, but also in terms of the applications. I think that's very important. But B, and this is maybe more important, the idea that, that and Mike Roca and others have talked about this, this idea of NBIC science, nanobioinfo cosmos. So the idea that, that the, the science gets not just more complex within discipline, science gets more complex across disciplines. Uh, so all of a sudden, we're talking about synthetic biology. We're talking using the building blocks of nature and building from the bottom up rather than analyzing from the top down. We're talking fields like big data came up this morning already, uh, nano medicine and so on. So we're talking about things that, A, I never learned about in school. And given at the rate at which these, science, these issues emerge, most people will not have learned about in school. Uh, maybe not even in K-16. Um, and, and more importantly, all of these things bring when it comes to public interface of the life sciences, questions that have much more to do with what we should be doing than what we are, than, we can, than what science can do. And all of our surveys show the exact same thing, meaning public, the public is, is very trusting in, in the science, getting the science right. They have many more concerns when it comes to the applications of that science, or what in the Human Genome Initiative was called the ethical, legal, social implications of that. So I guess. That's our first issue, and I don't want to call it a problem because it's just a reality. That's the way it is, and it will not change anytime soon. In fact, if you look at the rate, um, Andrew Maynard gives a good talk on this of, of development. Uh, these things arrive very, very quickly in the bench to bedside transition happens much too quickly. The second problem is that in the past, what we've done is we've relied on a bunch of bridge, bridge builders, for lack of a better term, we've relied on, on public science interfaces. Um, and those were called science journalists. Um, those were called science media. Um, and uh, this morning, I very briefly mentioned uh, mentioned the statistic. I think already, when you look at, at the late late 80s, early 90s, um, on average, every state in the union had about two newspapers with a science section. That's not great, but it's certainly much better than what we had in the mid 90s. Uh, we were down to about 27 or so. Um, and if you look at today, we're uh, and this is probably even lower. Uh, we're at 19. Um, most of you have followed the, 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 uh, the discussions around the New York Times closing their environmental desk. Um, that was not just their environmental desk, it also included their green blog um, and, and, and a whole bunch of other um, science outlets, closing a lot of science journalists, leaving so our traditional infrastructure. The ones we trusted to take 15 years of science and translate it into 300 words or less. And explain to a lay audience over coffee in the morning who care a lot about a lot of other things than science at that very moment, why that matters to their daily life, those, those infrastructures. So that's, I think, where we are. What does that mean? Uh, well, actually, let me do one other thing here, and that is that, that the academic infrastructures, of course, are not far behind in terms of science writing programs closing all over the place, the big five even beginning to close Johns Hopkins, that was just last month. 
Um, I think a lot of other places having the exact same issue, where even the training of that is now dying off in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the wake of, of some of these developments. So a few agenda items just really quickly. Um, and the first one, and I, and I will keep hammering this point, mostly because I think it matters tremendously, is the idea that we're not operating in a vacuum. If we communicate, if we talk about public communication and public engagement, the idea that we're in a lecture hall and maybe have a Q&A in that lecture hall or that we're in a doctor's office and it's like a patient-doctor relationship is, is not inaccurate, but it's, it's really simplistic. Um, because, the, as I said this morning, much more likely that we're in a doctor's office with a lot of voices yelling in our ear, with a lot of regulatory um, people sitting there as well telling us what's the problem with the medicines that we're about to take and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a complicated interface, and it's a complicated interface that we unfortunately need to enter. Why? Because no matter, if we don't talk about the science, somebody else will. And if we don't come up with a term, somebody else will. If that's Franken-food, if that's Franken-salmon, if that's whatever else, somebody will come up with a way of talking about this technology and a way of, 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 of essentially providing heuristics to, a, to, to various audiences, policy and lay uh, alike. Um, John Holdren learned this the hard way when he went from Belfer to, uh, to OSTP um, and tried to reframe the issue of global climate change uh, in, into global climate disruption, trying to get, by changing the term, trying to get across the term of, of, of how problematic this really was. It's not just a gradual increase. This is something that will bring disruptions all over the place. The problem is he immediately got hammered by Fox News and a number of, of conservative commentators for reframing the issue for political gain. Meaning once a frame is established, once the terminology is out there, and again, that, that was the success of the intelligent design movement, they carefully, they carefully researched hundreds of phrases and then showed absolute message, message discipline around it's just a theory to teach the controversy. The two frames that resonate exceptionally well with, with interpretive schemas that we all use. So that's number one. It, it, it's, a, it's a wild world out there, and we'd better learn to, to play within it. Second one is this whole idea of trust. Um, and we've heard this today, and I, so I don't want to spend a lot of time, but the idea that we're living in a world where there's a trust deficit um, and where science is just radically, uh, rapidly losing trust is just not true. Um, some, of the, some of the surveys that have, that have allegedly shown that or that have shown widening gaps, and I think there's some wisdom to that. But if you look at it over time, and I just applauded here the press, so this, they all use basically general social, science, uh, general social survey data. Um, if you look at the press, and I just plotted the, the percentage of respondents here who have a great deal of trust, but not great or some, but only a great deal. For the press, you can see never really trusted all that much, and that has declined. Um, organized religion, but if you actually look at science, it's fairly high up there, and it actually hasn't shown a tr a, an overall declining trend. In fact, when you look at issues like nanotechnology, which I don't have here, but if you look at issues like nanotechnology, if you ask people, who do you trust to provide you with objective information? And you ask a whole bunch of, from the White House to news media to industry scientists, you randomly order those questions. University scientists will always end up at the very top. They're the most trusted research. I think that's an opportunity um, that, um, and, and rather than a, a problem. At this point. The third one is that if we like it or not, and this is just a, 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 a naive summary of some of, the, some of the research, but we all use heuristics if we like it or not. And Dan just put this, I think, very eloquently um, and, and looked at it from different angles. Uh, the idea that, that not only can't we, can, can we not understand all science that's out there as, as lay audiences, but it makes no rational sense because it's just never going to happen. And I like that whole line about, you know, by the time you're halfway through, you're going to be dead anyway, most likely because you didn't learn one area that you should have known in the first place in certain medicine. Problem is, and this is important for this room, scientists are not any different either. I mean, to break it to you, so this is, uh, we, we survey on a routine basis the, the leading scientists in, in various fields, in this case, and the technology, we multi-page search things, search through web of science, look at the most highly cited people. These are the people who lead these fields, and most, again, those are the ones who are cited by everybody in their field. And then we ask them questions, same as we ask for the general population. Um, this one, for example, predicting their, their stance on nano being regulated. Should nano be regulated? Do we need more regulation? And then we ask them, of course, their scientific judgments. So we ask them a whole bunch of risk questions, benefit questions. Where is their scientific judgment? And those predict as they should, meaning the more risk scientists see, um, the more likely they are to support um, 
regulations. But after we control out gender, after we control out a whole bunch of other things, the interesting thing is this is all significant too, meaning the leading scientists in a particular discipline will make judgments when it comes to the application and the policy implications of their work that are directly influenced by their personal ideology. So our value systems and our heuristics that we think those lay publics use who don't know any better are the exact same things that we all use, especially when it comes to uncertain science, or at least science that is still where maybe the, 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 the conclusions or the, the research is, is not quite as far as toxicology goes, is not quite where it should be um, in order to make sound policy judgments, but where we do need policy judgments, if we like it or not, uh, because of the need for potential need for regulation. So um, the, uh, the fourth one is, is as refers to, and, I, and this is a, what I really like, it, 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 the CEO of, of Twitter just, just produced this line, uh, the idea that mass media are dead. And his, his statement was the replacement is we're talking about a global information distribution for the people by the people. That's what he describes Twitter, a platform for the global information distribution. So we're going away from mass media where we provide information or somebody provides information for a mass audience. Um, or maybe even some blog where there's some uh, back and forth to a whole new information environment. Um, and I just want to show you one thing really quickly. This is uh, based on some of our, our more recent research. Um, and, and again, coming back to the idea of what these interfaces look like. As a lot of this shifts online, what changes dramatically is how these pieces of information are being used. Um, so we wrote a, a, a piece, uh, that we, did a, we did an experimental study where we gave people the exact same science story on blog, um, and then simply modified um, uh, or manipulated experimentally um, the comments that they got. The comments were not manipulated based on content, they were simply manipulated based on the tone, where they're more or less civil, more or less polite. Uh, so it's a story about nano silver, and then you know people were arguing about if that's really good or bad, risky or not. Um, except for in one, they said, I disagree with you, and the other one said, I disagree with you, you're idiot. <laughs> so that was essentially the, the, the difference. And what, what, what we showed is, or what we found is that in the condition where people saw the exact same story and the exact same comments, except for they were less polite, people made inferences about the technology being more risky potentially. And essentially their views got polarized. So in other words, that information environment, and this is, by the way, this was the story, classic Milwaukee Journal Sentinel was the first one to pick up on this story. At the bottom of the page, well hidden, you know, within coupons and, and as classic science reporting. And then, and if you looked at the at the online story, you of course immediately see the idea that thousands of people like this. If I'm a reader, so where do my cues go? My cues tell me already where the social environment is going. Should I like this story? How often has it been forwarded? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So in other words, we no longer have an inv information environment where there is an objective piece of information. The moment I see information at this moment, I know if it's been retweeted. I know what the social acceptance is of that. I know what the general support is for it. Uh, most likely, by the way, I may not get certain stories on, the, on my news feed anymore in the first place if, I, if my, my browsing pattern and my click patterns don't indicate that I'm interested. I never have read a single story on baseball in my whole life. We'll never read one, don't care. So, the, the, so basic news algorithms will never give me a story on baseball. Why should they? And the tablets that we all read and so on will increasingly give us a news diet that is tailored toward each one of us, meaning if I don't care about science in the first place, I will get less and less science news overall. Again, think about interfaces and that mattering um, for ultimately how we, um, how we make decisions and, and ultimately how we, how we get more information um, or, 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 or additional information. Last one really quickly, um, the idea that, that Winging it or using some information, some uh, uh, I mean, some communication is better ultimately than doing communication uh, that's uh, that's uh, than, than, no, than, than doing no communication at all. So ultimately, my my point here being, um, doing communication that's based that's not based on data or based on bad data can completely backfire or produce a gigantic boomerang effect. Global climate change being a good example. What Gallup does over time is they ask a question where they ask people um, to which degree they think uh, coverage or, or reporting on global climate change for instance, is exaggerated. Um, so in other words, do they think there's too much coverage and really goes overboard? Um, and you see a few peaks here. And those peaks tend to, in a funny way, correlate very nicely with various movies coming out that do make this a big issue. 
Um, and second will be Inconvenient Truth. Then, of course, a Nobel Prize um, and an Oscar. Um, and then it's really highest for Cancun. So in other words, the more we talk about it, without necessarily thinking how we're talking about it, and this is not causal evidence, this is just an illustration. I really would not want to use this as evidence. But the point being, simply talking more about it and simply putting more stuff out there without really thinking about the interface, the audiences, and whatever else, um, in many cases produces just, produces the opposite, especially if the message is one that's so strongly ideologically anchored to somebody like Al Gore, for instance, um, or so strongly anchored to the prediction we just talked about this earlier before the session, so strongly anchored to the prediction that this is true, there is consensus, and this is not going to change overall. Um, so I'm going to leave it with that. Um, I, 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 I put a few readings on the slides if anybody uh, would like to. Uh, <coughs> more, and I, I, I put links to all the legal PDFs that are floating around um, somewhere online, so you can, you can click on those.